So the first type of encryption we're going to be talking about in order to secure our data is how we encrypt data in motion. And the reason why I'm starting with this one is because this one is more familiar to us. Uh, you may have been encrypting data in motion your whole time, your whole life, and never even realized it up until this point. So what we're talking about first is how does encrypting data in motion really work? Huge video coming up, but get ready because this is chock full of real world scenarios. I'll see you there. Now, data in motion is going to be one of the more important things that you want to protect first, because quite frankly, it's one of the easiest things that there are to hack. Using a what's called a very fancy term here, a protocol analyzer. What, what is a protocol analyzer? A hacker can use something called a protocol analyzer to literally grab traffic as it flows across the wire. And if that traffic is sent in clear text, like passwords, if we're not doing any form of encryption, uh, trying to secretize uh, our, our passwords as they flow across the wire, as they go from uh, one device to the next, then a hacker who's listening to that traffic using a protocol analyzer can intercept that traffic. It can literally grab a copy of all of the packets that flow across the network and very easily reconstruct it and able to see what the passwords are. So how does this really look at the end of the day? Well, you're sitting here on your computer and you want to log into a network switch. Now, maybe the network switch has a uh, front-end web GUI, so you can access it from the user bar, or the URL bar, I should say, sorry, <laughs> the, the actual address bar. Uh, or maybe you want to log into it. Maybe you want to actually jump into it uh, via the command line. You want to use the command line interfaces, so you want to remote into it and access the command line remotely. If you were to use an unencrypted protocol and you go to, say, the web browser and you type in your username and your password, or you try to use a protocol like Telnet to access the command line and you type in your username and your password, any of the traffic that flows across this wire, if a bad actor, everybody draw some evil eyes here, but he's smiling, um, it, that bad actor could be listening to this traffic as it flows across the wire and intercepting it before it makes its way towards the actual switch. And they can easily, and I mean very easily, reconstruct the stream of packets as they go back and forth and then actually intercept the passwords. Now, protocol analyzers, you may actually end up using these quite a bit in your professional career, not for hacking purposes, but just to troubleshoot. This is a very, very common thing to do, and I'd encourage you to actually check out the content on a tool like Wireshark here on CBT Nuggets. We have dedicated content to teaching you how to use protocol analyzers like Wireshark right here. And I, I can't tell you, uh, this is one of those tools where me as a professional, I was kind of resistant to learn how to use this tool at first. It just seemed like... Uh, one more thing that I didn't really need to know, I figured I could just get by on basic knowledge, but Wireshark, if you actually learn how to use the tool, this can save you, and I'm not kidding, I mean thousands of hours of work throughout your career. Just so much work. If you understand how protocols work, the exact protocol that you're trying to, to, to use, and that protocol isn't working, just looking at the raw data as it moves across the wire, you can very easily say, oh, well, there's the problem, and let me go fix it real quick. Instead of just trying to go through a whole bunch of show commands or clicking on all of these different metrics and analytics, the Wireshark is a great way to actually learn how to troubleshoot. But because its sole purpose in life is to extract the packets as they flow across the wire and read them and stream them literally in real time out to the screen, uh, guess what? Hackers can also use this tool. They would love to grab the data as it's in motion across the wire. That's exactly one of the tools that they do. So how do we get around this? How do we stop them from reading our usernames and passwords? It's just as simple as applying encryption to whatever protocols that we're using. Let's talk about one of the most common ways that you use encryption every single day as data flows across the wire. Here on my screen, I've brought up the website OpenSea. Io. This is a, a marketplace for trading non-fungible tokens or NFTs on blockchains. And I happen to really like OpenSea and I happen to really like uh, these little, these cute little bulldogs here. Now, the thing about this is, is when I go to OpenSea, uh, these are financial transactions that I'm making here. I'm literally purchasing this 
uh, with my cryptocurrencies, in this case, Ethereum. Uh, and, and this is one of those things where like, okay, well, I don't want this information to just go out to the world so that anybody can grab uh, whatever tokens I'm using and whatever, uh, you know, my address spaces and how much money am I spending, blah, 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 blah. So what we look for is the, 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 the lock, right? You're used to seeing the lock and you're probably used to seeing a green lock. Well, there's actually varying degrees of the lock. <laughs> and what are we talking about here? What we're really talking about here is applying an encryption certificate to the website. And this is going to be an extraordinarily high level crash course in how this works. But when you see the lock, you know right here that we have a valid certificate in place and we know that data that gets sent to this web server and sent back has been encrypted just for me in our session. And that way, anybody who's listening to this using something like a protocol analyzer like Wireshark, it's going to look like gobbledygook. It's just going to look like random characters all over the place, and there's no way that they could possibly understand what the data is as it's being transmitted back and forth. So how does it actually so how does it actually work? Again, this is going to be a very, very simplified way of how it works. The way certificate works is they use something called asymmetric encryption. And there's a whole bunch of uh, phases to how this encryption is, works. But basically what asymmetric encryption means uh, that we're going to create two keys. Here, I'll draw a little key like this and a little key like this. The idea is that mathematically these keys can work together. One key can be used to encrypt data and the other key can be used to decrypt the data. Now, yes, it does work in two directions. This key could encrypt the data and this key could decrypt the data, but mathematically, this is the fundamental design. Let's just keep it in one direction right now uh, for the, the simplistic sake. So the idea here is that we have one key that can encrypt the data. So what OpenC may do is they'll take this key that's allowed to encrypt the data and they put this on public use. Anyone can grab this key and start to encrypt data. So my computer, when I go to opensea.com or .io, it goes to this website and it grabs what's called the public key and it receives the public key and it knows that this public key is a good key to use. So what this website and, this, and my computer now need to do is we need to establish a session. And in order to do that, my computer is gonna generate a random key one more time called a session key. Using their public key, I will encrypt my session key with it. So if my session key, let's say we generated ABC123, I take their public key and encrypt it immediately. And that encryption looks like exclamation, period, 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 five, E, period, Z, Y, N, three. Something totally bizarre and gobbledygook that's not actually the session key that I generated. I send this back to the website. And this is where the part gets cool. So far, we've only talked about the key that was public. What about the other key? The other key that's used to decrypt the data is stored privately on the website. So when the server, the web server here, receives this gobbledygook that I've sent them, they can decrypt it with the private key. When they decrypt it with the private key, they now know what the session key looks like and we can now build a private session between just my computer and the website because we were able to securely exchange a session key back and forth. All of this stuff, this certificate with keys, this is handled sort of by a protocol called SSL. Reality, but in reality, SSL is actually kind of old and it's evolved to become something called TLS. Chances are today, when you talk about this in the workplace and, and you go to a fellow employee, you're gonna say something like, oh, we need to buy an SSL certificate, when in reality, what it's really using under the hood is TLS. Now, what is the SSL certificate and what is the TLS certificate? When OpenSea goes to purchase an SSL or a TLS certificate, they actually have to verify their identity with a third-party service. This is going to be something like GoDaddy, who is issuing the certificate. And they're saying, hey, OpenSea is who they say they are, so you can trust this public key. That when you send your key to them, your session key to them, you know it is actually arriving at OpenSea. Again, 
This is a, a bit of a crash course on how TLS works, uh, but this is what's really going to happen. This, I mean, it's it, it can be kind of an overwhelming process. I'm not going to lie. The first time you go through acquiring a, a public SSL certificate and installing it into a web server to work, it can be uh, a bit of an overwhelming process. And this is why uh, certification exams like the Security Plus uh, harp like this is a tremendous amount of information that exists on those certification exams dedicated to just this dedicated to just asymmetric encryption and dedicated to just all of the different kinds of certificates that are available. And what does it actually mean to use a TLS certificate? What does it actually mean to install a TLS certificate? At the, for, the, for the Server Plus certification exam, what you need to know is that when it comes to browsing the web, you're going to look for SSL and TLS-based certificates. And you know when you see the little lock, you've got it. So you're accessing a server like OpenSea that has been verified. Their identity has been verified by a third party like GoDaddy. And when we access, when we access that web server, we're using their public key to generate our own session key and encrypt it, sending it to them where they then decrypt it with their private key. That's the fundamental essence of how it works. Now, where do you go to get certificates? In the past, my favorite place to go to was gogetssl.com. Why? Because it's really, really cheap. I mean, really cheap. A lot of SSL certificate places to buy them from, uh, you know, they can be pretty pricey, but you know, they're also like uh, very reputable places. When, you, when you're in a pinch and you need a super cheap SSL certificate, look, you can get them for as cheap as $4.43. Uh, and that's, that's a great way to go. It lasts for years, and that's super, super cool to get an SSL certificate. But you can even get SSL certificates for free using the Let's Encrypt service. Let'sencrypt.org is a free SSL certificate organization. It goes through a little bit harder of a process to verify your identity and acquire their certificate and install it, but it's free, and I mean free. Now, these certificates only last three months, so you got to make sure you renew them, too, as opposed to the other certificates that you can buy that can last years. So keep that in mind, too, uh, that, you know, usually when with lower costs comes more labor, and that, that's absolutely the case. But on Linux-based operating systems, they've made it really, really easy uh, to acquire Let's Encrypt certificates and auto-renew them. In fact, I recently did this with my own personal website. I had Nginx installed uh, as the web server, and then I installed what's called the Nginx CertBot package. And what this was, it was literally a bot that handled my certificates. And it goes to Let's Encrypt to get the free certificate, install it onto my web server, and automatically renew it. So there are a lot of scripting and methodologies and ways to work around the labor that comes with getting a free certificate, uh, especially if you use Linux-based operating systems. But this also works for Windows. If you're running an IIS environment, you could absolutely use Let's Encrypt uh, to generate an, an SSL certificate. See, I already said SSL, it's really TLS. Uh, to generate an SSL certificate, install it into IIS, uh, then you just gotta go through the renewal process. You can use PowerShell scripting to automate that for you too. Ask me how I know. So that's one way that we can handle data in flight. And that primarily focuses on browsing the web using HTTP and HTTPS. But in another example that we talked about, we talked about my computer uh, trying to telnet into a network switch, right? We wanted to access the command line. We're not using the HTTP or HTTPS protocol to do that. Instead, I was using the telnet protocol, which was truly unsecure. Now, here's the thing. We're, we're pretty smart people, and we know that the telnet protocol is something that we're going to need, um, or at least remote access is something we're going to need to the command line of each of our network devices. But the telnet protocol just leaves us to expose. Keith Barker, uh, when I began my networking journey, I started right here with CBT Nuggets, started learning, and I watched Keith Barker's content, and he would say, friends don't let friends use Telnet. And that's the honest truth. That's because we would rather use something called SSH. And SSH goes through effectively the same kind of mechanism when we establish a session between my computer and the remote devices here. SSH is now setting up encryption encrypting the data 
as it flows across the wire yet again. When I'm typing commands, typing my username and typing password and pressing enter, before that gets sent out to the wire, it gets encrypted and the remote network device knows how to decrypt it and then send encrypted messages back. So keep that in mind too, a big no-no whenever we're accessing the console of any device, not just network device, but also servers, we're gonna be using SSH and never ever Telnet, really never Telnet unless you've got a really good reason to use Telnet. Now the last one that I wanna talk about is also accessing uh, the actual graphical user interface of servers remotely. On Windows devices, uh, this is gonna use remote desktop protocol. On Linux devices, this is gonna use VNC, typically it's VNC. When we wanna actually click around on the server, but we're not physically on the server, we can use one of these two protocols to access the GUI interface of the server itself. Now, obviously it goes without saying that encryption is gonna be built into these by default. We're not gonna be able to access uh, these devices over the network or even the public internet using unencrypted traffic. We have to use encryption it's built into these protocols by default. Luckily for us, the server itself is what handles the bulk of that, usually by merely turning the protocol on and allowing it in through the local firewall, that does the trick. We're off to the races and we can now access these devices and send data back and forth. We can send files uh, through these remote desktop protocol or VNC sessions uh, and, and handle all of that that way and it's gonna be encrypted the entire time. Now, one last thing I wanna point out, I think this is very, very important to point out. This is uh, something that's kind of a new revolution. One of the newer revolutions that, we, that you'll find out in computers today is that Windows has become very, very uh, friendly towards the Linux operating system. In fact, many different Windows devices, including my desktop computer that I'm recording on right now, also runs Linux under the hood. And one of the cool things about Linux is that it's so incredibly lightweight that we typically don't need a GUI. In fact, we could get around with Linux just fine, just using nothing but the CLI or command prompt. But if the Linux server is, you know, across town and there's no GUI, so we can't use VNC, how then do we access it? Well, it's a CLI at the end of the day, so we can use good old fashioned SSH. But now Windows devices also support Windows, supports SSH using open SSH. So now you can SSH into Windows computers and Windows servers and access the command line of your Windows devices using SSH. And since Windows also runs Linux under the hood, you can SSH into the Linux portion of your Windows computer. <laughs> that's right. Like there's a whole lot of SSH that's happening these days, a whole lot of command lines. And one of the things that you want to get really familiar with as a systems administrator is either going to be the Linux command line, which is known as bash short for born again shell, or you're going to want to get familiar with windows PowerShell. These things I, I know as a new systems engineer and a new systems administrator, it just sounds awful. I know this, I, I know how you feel. I would much rather uh, click around in GUI interfaces and be familiar with you know the pretty colors and all the buttons and everything like that. But scripting and automation and understanding what these powerful uh, programming languages can do for you, that, that sets you apart in a big way and you can do phenomenal things with technology when you start to just understand basic bash and basic PowerShell. Again, content right up there in the search bar if you want to check it out. So this has been Under in Motion. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.